we uh, basically um, we'd like to explore the issue on the um, neolithization uh, or the spread of uh, neolithic uh, pathways uh, from the uh, central Anatolian region and the core region into northwest Anatolia, which is something that we begin to see uh, in uh, the between sort of 6,700 uh, or 6,600, uh, where uh, settlements um, begin to appear in uh, regions uh, to the northwest and the west of Anatolia and then thereafter beyond. Uh, and what we find here is that the um, expansion is rather fast. It's a rapid expansion uh, where, uh, you know, it's taking millennia for this to happen in the near, in the, in the, in the near east in the core area. Uh, it's, it's a much faster process. And we know that the wild progenitors of the, um, the, the products, the cereals, the lentils, the animals, are not uh, available, so they're bringing their their uh, their um, packages. We can call them with them, uh, and uh, we also see that the uh, the earliest farmers already had uh, a developed uh, farming economy. Uh, and um, this is a map from uh, uh, Barbara Horish's uh, article from 2015, uh, and it lists uh, Barjan as a Neolithic pioneer site. And we, uh, Foka and I, and the, uh, our uh, collaborating team members also would uh, agree that this is one of the earliest uh, settlements in the region where groups were coming uh, in order to ha inhabit it as uh, immigrant farming communities. Uh, and as you can see, there's some arrows here on these maps. And uh, we also, uh, it, it would be make most sense. And we agree that this would be an overland route uh, as opposed to one that goes from the shore. Uh, and uh, there are in fact different um, uh, different uh, subsistence strategies where we have pigs, for example, uh, reaching uh, the shore uh, regions uh, transported by boat uh, in the inland regions, uh, starting at also Chatalhuyuk uh, and also into uh, Northwest Anatolia, we have uh, sheep, goat uh, and cattle uh, as the primary um, uh, subsistence uh, um, herd, the subsistence animals that are herded. Um, um, so I'd like to also provide, before uh, Foka jumps into the stratigraphy, just a little bit of background on the research uh, that has been done uh, prior to the, re uh, to the work that we did uh, at um, uh, in, this, in the Bursa region or the Marmara region in general, uh, and thereafter uh, show you some examples of uh, how, what the elements we contributed towards. Uh, we already, before the year 2000, already in the 1950s, in fact, Fikir Tepe was excavated and Pandik and Ilupanar began excavations in the 1980s. Manteshe came slightly later in the 1990s. Uh, and we had already a chronological table, some of them based on uh, radiocarbon dates and others on the actual um, ceramic assemblages, uh, comparatively dating them to the second half of the seventh millennium BC. We know of some settlements that have um, round architecture uh, like Fikir Tepe uh, and burials beneath the houses, uh, as you can see uh, here, uh, and others where we have rectangular houses like at Ulupanar, uh, post um, uh, houses. Uh, and what's interesting though, uh, and what has uh, sort of been a juxtaposition is that we find uh, the similar kind of elements uh, within uh, these two different sort of house forms. And this has been sort of emphasized. We find uh, these so-called Fikir Tepe boxes, the similar types of pottery, uh, similar types of uh, blade tool uh, technology, uh, examples of flint and, and obsidian uh, that we have, the, these bullet cores, for example. Uh, and there has been sort of ideas that uh, even though it's a little bit fuzzy and there's a uh, there's some debate about it, that potentially um, there may have been uh, some hunter-gatherer influences that affected, uh, that uh, may have had some input with especially the round houses, but this is uh, still unclear. And I think in the future with DNA analyses becoming uh, so, uh, so uh, promising that we will in the future be finding um, some of the answers to these questions as to whether we have hunter-gatherers uh, uh, appropriating agriculture and uh, 
farming communities coming in and whether this is represented in fact by these rectangular and square architecture. Uh, later on, uh, oh here's some arch, uh, we have a couple of uh, examples of uh, the, the problem is that from the earlier levels, we have very little uh, evidence for um, uh, any kind of habitation. We don't know that they are actually round architecture, or we have very little information on any Mesolithic or Epipaleolithic sites from earlier. Uh, later on, the excavations uh, continued uh, into after the year 2000, let's say, uh, into um, Bargen, of course, uh, starting in 2005 with us beginning in 2007. Uh, and um, most recently, Bachelier of Lara, but also Akto Praplikini Kapu and Kichichayra are among the sites that were excavated. Uh, and as you can see, we have brought the chronology further back to 6,600. Uh, recent dates from Akto Praplik also show the same dates, and uh, Bachelier of Lara has even earlier dates. And I think, uh, though, uh, because we have been excavating for uh, uh, so long, uh, a decade of, of excavations, uh, we've also been able able to contribute and fill this gap in terms of the stratigraphic um, uh, you know, uh, levels and try to understand the figure type of culture through looking at uh, levels just before uh, and the development of this culture. So I think we have uh, things to contribute. Uh, unlike Bachelier uh, Vlar, which has round houses, and Octoprocluc, which uh, these are the sort of where the houses are located, these yellow dots, uh, at, uh, as you'll hear uh, with Focus Talk just coming up, uh, we have uh, rectangular houses that have been part of the assemblage here. Um, we uh, here, uh, Barjanhuk is located in the Yenishir Valley, uh, and our excavation area was relatively large, and you'll be hearing more about this in a bit. Were to Foka mentioned that um, we have a, a full farming economy from the very earliest levels. These people brought with them, uh, as I mentioned already, their sheep, uh, their goat, and their cattle, uh, as well as their cereals. Uh, and uh, from the earliest levels onwards, we have uh, a reliance also on secondary products, including. Uh, you know, um, dairy products, uh, probably yogurts and cheeses and things like this uh, as well. Uh, and with that, I'd like to uh, stop sharing uh, and uh, have Foka take on the, the, the screen. Yeah, I'll share too then. And go to here. Um, well, let me also start by um, thanking Doug and thanking the uh, organizers for inviting us. It's a real pleasure to have this opportunity to talk about our uh, findings from the Barton York excavations and to uh, share that with so many colleagues uh, and friends. Um, I'm going to focus mostly on the settlement, on the architecture, on the on the settlement layout. Uh, as it uh, develops over time. Uh, and then I'll pass the word back to Rana to put it into a regional and interregional uh, uh, context. So um, we have this, this sort of slice through the Eastern Mount. It's a, it's a double mount, both together about one hectare of which only on the Eastern Mount there's evidence for Neolithic occupation. Uh, and um, as you can see on the, on the plan, we dug through sort of the, the center and the flank of the mount, um, going through sort of all occupation phases from the current surface down to, uh, to virgin soil. And we do have the um, uh, impression, the feeling that for each occupation phase, we have a relatively representative um, section of different components of uh, the settlement. Uh, and therefore, we think we have the, the uh, possibility to sort of compare what is happening between the different phases and how the settlement uh, develops, even though, as you can see from the plan, our total um, um, component of the Neolithic settlement that we excavated is only, is only very partial. 
So the site was not only excavated in the Neolithic period, there's uh, after about 6,000, there are a number of short episodes of later occupation. So in the early fifth millennium, in the early fourth millennium, in the third and maybe the beginning of the second millennium, uh, each time very briefly um, with, uh, with a, a varied impact on the mount in terms of uh, deposition and in terms of uh, disturbances of older levels. Clearly the Neolithic mound and Neolithic deposits are the main uh, deposits that, uh, that, that form the current mound. And um, uh, through our excavations, we have uh, a record of about 600 years, maybe a little bit more of Neolithic occupation at the site. And uh, uh, we've divided that into a number of occupation phases, the earliest 6E uh, and the latest 6 a, and um, I will focus today mostly on 6E, 6D1, and then compare that with 6D3 and 6C. Uh, I'm not really going to talk about the later occupation phases, the post-Neolithic occupation phases, but I want to point out one uh, feature. Oh, uh, uh, this is sort of like the, the, the chronological basis, the, the, the uh, C14 dates, there's about 85, so more than actually are in this table that securely um, show that there is continuous occupation through the uh, second half of the seventh millennium BC. Uh, this is one uh, later occupation phase that I want to show. Uh, as you can see on the, on the plan from uh, the central part of the, of the trenches, Post-Neolithic uh, occupation, middle Calculithic occupation involved the, the construction and use of a large number of deep, large pits going sometimes three, four meters into the mound, um, presumably used as, uh, as silos. They have this uh, sort of uh, um, um, beehive shaped uh, um, uh, shape that uh, that uh, is is uh, something that you see with the silos, uh, and that, as you can understand, has really um, extensively damaged the the later Neolithic phases. So six B has uh, quite a bit of damage, and six A is a phase where uh, we are really struggling to understand what the settlement and architecture looked like because of all the disturbances. Uh, so let's go to the very beginning, uh, the 6E settlement, which uh, was founded on, uh, on virgin soil. On the overall plan in white, you can see the areas where we, where we exposed 6E um, deposits and basically everywhere where we reached 6E, we also reached uh, virgin soil uh, just, just underneath it. Uh, and you'll, 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 you'll see a, a, a layout of the settlement here that, uh, that you'll see recur through a number of the phases, whereby we have a, a, an area with houses here in the central part of the mount. We have a large open space. In this case, that is bounded to the south in this early period by a, a natural depression uh, that in 6E filled up with, with midden layers. Uh, and south of that, we may have more architecture. This is not quite certain, but uh, throughout the early phases, we have traces of, uh, of architecture and of burials also in this, in this southern area. So the houses we have from this period, uh, from this central area, uh, we found in the form of large post holes, uh, making, making uh, uh, the framework for two adjacent houses, uh, structure 24 and 25. One is here and, and one is uh, here directly to the east. Um, it's associated with, uh, with some surfaces, but we're not always certain which surfaces uh, are contemporary with the houses, with the inhabit habitation of the houses and which uh, may predate it slightly. But uh, we, can, we can sort of recognize this as a timber built rectangular architecture, whereby for each individual post, a post hole was dug. And these go uh, deeply into the ground, sometimes 80 uh, centimeters into the ground, 
for individual posts and uh, where we can where we can recognize this. It seems like the posts were uh, 20, 25 centimeters in diameter. So quite substantial posts. <clears throat> in the, uh, so here you see in the north, in the central part these two houses. In the southern part of the site at this moment, we have activity going on uh, that left traces in this depression, um, whereby people initially were digging large deep pits into the base of this depression, maybe for clay extraction, maybe uh, for other functions, we don't quite know, um, but uh, these were then filled up again. And after that, the depression was uh, used to dump garbage in, and, and in 6E, but also in uh, some of the later phases, uh, we have these, these uh, midden layers often quite uh, uh, full of uh, ash and charcoal and, uh, and uh, garbage. And this is a, a very finely stratified filling of this depression. And this has really helped us to establish um, uh, a ceramic sequence and, and uh, get uh, our handle on the, on the um, um, developments in the artifactual records. <clears throat> in, the, in the 6E phase, in the deepest levels in this uh, depression, we find a lot of these fire cracked rocks or so pebbles, uh, rocks that have uh, these angular shapes that we think uh, cracked due to uh, heat and that we think may have been used uh, for uh, hot rock cooking where they were heated and then uh, uh, put together with food uh, to cook, to heat and to food, cook uh, food. Uh, and after they cracked and became unusual, they were unusable, they were dumped into this, this uh, depression. And we find, we find many, many uh, kilos of these rocks, uh, especially in 6E, and then disappearing largely from the later phases. Um, we have some ceramics from uh, the, this depression and this, these midden fills from uh, 6E. Uh, we have some wooden, uh, some bone tools, bone spoons and bone pins, etc. Dentalium shells uh, and uh, uh, a lot of animal bone, a lot of lithics, etc. The, the ceramics from this period, from the 6E uh, phase, it's, it's well-made ceramics, but in very simple shapes, relatively thick walled with simple uh, whole mouth shapes and simple uh, lips. Schist temper, mica and schist tempered, um, uh, and sometimes with these lug handles, as you see at the bottom here. Uh, and one uh, artifact that we found in these midden deposits from 6E is this a uh, square low vessel with a lug handle uh, and four short stubby legs, which seems like a, a kind of precursor to the later Fikir Tepe boxes, but uh, predating it by, by several centuries. In, in this midden area, in the fill, in this depression, we also found several adult burials. Um, fairly typical burials for, uh, for the period and the region, single inhumation burials in simple uh, pits, whereby the corpse generally is laid on, uh, on its side, uh, knees pulled up, in these cases not very tightly flexed in later periods, we also find sometimes that the, the, the skeletons are very, very tightly flexed. Moving on then to the next period. So now we're talking about 6,500 uh, or the 65th century BC. Here again, you see the, the, um, the overall settlement plan with a row of houses, uh, a large open space. This, this depression uh, continues to be used for, for garbage dumping. And at the Southern extent of the, of the site, maybe again uh, architecture that we can recognize from small post holes and some hearth uh, and a few burials. But we have the best evidence for the architecture from this period from this central row of houses. Uh, and maybe if you remember the 6E settlement plan, uh, 
uh, these houses from 6D1 are uh, erected sort of directly on top of the earlier buildings. So here you see again 6E and the 6D1 buildings are almost directly on top of them. Um, the building technique changes a little bit in, in, in this case and from now on throughout the Neolithic occupation, uh, the, the, the basic technique was to dig ditches, foundation ditches to, to uh, erect rows of fairly thin posts in these ditches um, to fill up the ditch and then create walls out of these rows of posts by, by uh, filling it up with mud and smearing mud against the sides of these walls, uh, producing about 25, 30 centimeter wide walls that were then plastered on both sides with, with mud plaster. Uh, so the 6E buildings are a little bit different from 6D1 and later buildings, but uh, in both periods, uh, timber is a major uh, construction element. Now these 6D1 buildings um, are relatively well preserved. Uh, let me just go back here. Here you can see sort of the, the overall uh, layout in a photo. It's a, it's a row of four buildings. Uh, with the walls preserved to about 50, 60 centimeters. Uh, and uh, what are interesting elements of this architecture is that we seem to have a sort of like a, a series of a small room followed by a big room, followed by a small room, followed by a big room. Um, and what is, what is relevant is that they all share the same walls. So this must be understood as a single building project, not individual buildings that were, that were set against each other, but one large um, building project producing at least four different rooms. I don't know if we can call each of them separate houses, but four uh, spaces as part of one row of, uh, of rooms, all having entrances on the southern side, uh, the southern side facing this open courtyard uh, space. <clears throat> and uh, also confirming the notion that this is sort of like one complex uh, is the fact that there is this one aligned row of central roof bearing posts. We're not certain, we don't have um, uh, uh, very strong evidence for it, but we, we assume that these buildings must have gabled roofs. Uh, and so maybe there would have been one uh, rooftop line going across at least these four uh, spaces. One of the larger rooms it has this interesting feature in that in its earlier use phase, it has a, a red floor sort of rusty red brown color made of loam. It's not real plastered, but uh, it clearly um, uh, must have taken a, an effort to, to create this colored uh, mud, colored loam, colored uh, um, dirt to, to turn into a, uh, a um, dirt floor. There's, there's the, uh, this building phase, the interior is very clean. There were hardly any finds from this, uh, from this floor. So nothing really to help us understand whether there was anything uh, significant about this building and its, uh, its use. It doesn't um, appear apart then from the red color that there is anything unusual about this building. Um, there are some modifications in this uh, in this uh, row of houses somewhere through the occupation phase. The the doors of some of the bigger uh, houses and also the smaller spaces are made narrower, and uh, a a connection that in the earlier phase was here between structure two B and two A is uh, is closed off. And in the larger buildings now, there's ovens set into the into the southeast corner of these uh, of these spaces. This later phase of these buildings burned down. It was destroyed in a fire, uh, and as a result, we have we have a number of interesting details on how these buildings on sort of the interior fittings of these buildings. So we know that the smaller rooms had suspended floors 
maybe suspended 10, 15 centimeters above the um, above the ground, which may have been moist, which may have uh, 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 provided a, a, a presented a problem, and these raised floors may have been a response to this uh, to this issue, to this moisture. So by putting down a, a framework, a lattice work of, uh, of uh, wooden, small wooden beams, and then covering that with planks and covering the planks with uh, mud, they would have raised the, um, the floors in these smaller rooms. Uh, and, and from underneath the, the, uh, the wooden planks, uh, we have um, mice bone, uh, bones, quite a few, and teeth that indicate that this really was a, an, an opening underneath there and that they had rodents underneath the floor, um, supposedly waiting for food uh, remains to come down between the cracks of the, of the platforms. Uh, another interesting feature of uh, structure 2A is that in front of the uh, entrance, almost in front of the entrance, where uh, one of the, um, not the latest floor, but one floor underneath of this mud plastered floor, uh, hardened by the fire, showed uh, the presence of two footprints. Uh, you can see one very clearly here, the other one is right next to it, but it's a little bit less well visible uh, but here you can see them see them again so when they plastered the floor and when the loam was still moist and soft someone stood here uh, and left two footprints um, in in the clay then the floor was plastered again then the building burned down and that made it uh, hardened it and preserved these footprints um, we don't know if this is if this is random if this uh, is a, a, an accident of uh, the plastering process or whether this is uh, uh, meaningful. But what does seem an indication that this could be meaningful is that underneath the, uh, the footprints, or at least the left one of the footprint, um, were a number of things buried under the or, or placed underneath the floor when, when this plaster floor was uh, um, Put down. So this included a, um, uh, a, a grinding platform, a number of uh, pounders, as well as a uh, cattle skull that was placed upside down under the uh, on the on the earlier floor before the upper one was put on top of it. And then someone stood on top of this as if to sort of like press it down extra hard in this location. Uh, because the buildings uh, burned down, we also find a number of things that may have been cleared out if they had um, uh, abandoned them, that these buildings in a more regular fashion. So there were a lot of objects left on the, on the floors, especially of the two smaller buildings, 21 and um, uh, 2A, uh, evidence for a, a storage of lentils that maybe had been uh, kept in in a in a bag or in a sack or something, uh, stone axes, uh, polishing stones, figurines, um, an animal figurine and the head of a of a uh, human figurine, bone knuckle uh, knuckle bones, um, sling pellets and uh, and pottery also. Jumping ahead to uh, the period around 6300, 6200 BC, um, a, a architectural phase that uh, uh, seems to be rather long lived and, and in terms of our phasing uh, appears to sit sort of on the boundary of 6D3 and uh, 6C. Um, as you may recognize in the location where we had the 6E buildings and the 6D1 buildings, there is once again a row of, uh, of houses uh, in front of a larger courtyard to the south, an open space to the south. And different now from, uh, from previous periods is that there is another cluster of uh, architectural spaces of structures now in what, what was previously an open space. And before that would have been sort of the the um, the side over the side of this depression. 
and mostly outside the excavation trenches, but here in the, in the southeast and here in the north, there are uh, hints that the settlement continued, but also that there's maybe more of these clusters of buildings that we didn't have evidence for in earlier periods. Uh, here you see a photo of, uh, of this, this southern cluster of, uh, of architecture. You can also recognize on the photo that even in this phase, uh, uh, 6D3, 6C, there's still a lot of damage uh, of these large pits. Uh, you see a pit here, you see a large pit here, and another one here. Uh, mostly these, uh, as we discovered later, were uh, these uh, uh, middle calculatic silo pits. But uh, at this level, uh, uh, we, we started to see also more coherent indoor and outdoor spaces, walls, uh, etc. <clears throat> and here, uh, one of the interesting things that we found here was this very substantial oven. Uh, you see it here in different states of uh, uh, stages of the excavation. So it's a it was a circular oven, presumably a domed uh, oven, with uh, a number of successive floors, uh, each separated by layers of pebbles. Uh, and uh, underneath this circular oven was a, a sort of a square base dug into the ground. Uh, um, and completely filled with uh, with rocks and rubble, presumably uh, for uh, for maintaining the heat inside the oven. So here on the bottom right, you can see the, the about fifty centimeter deep um, shaft, deep pit that uh, square pit that was dug into the ground uh, to fill with uh, with rubble for underneath the oven floor. <laughs> Here in the middle, you see this uh, the base of this oven again. Uh, to the south of it, we found this interesting feature also dug into the ground, this rectangular feature, a kind of bin and maybe a semi-underground storage space. And you can make out on the photo, hopefully, that it had this plank-built floor. This didn't burn down. The wood is not preserved, but from the impressions, we can see where these planks would have uh, would have made a, uh, a floor, and here on this photo you can see it a little bit, um, a little bit better. Uh, and to the north, from a slightly later period, a, a inhumation burial dug into these uh, into these deposits. <laughs> An example of one of these very very tightly flexed um, corpses, whereby the, the the knee and the head and the, and the, and the elbows are really tightly. Um, um, bound against the chest of chest of the individual. Uh, underneath this plank floor, an interesting find was this uh, probably deposited, probably buried um, fikir tepe box placed upside down uh, and left there before this plank floor was built. Uh, so now a six C days to six C. We're really in a, in a period that compares with what we know from sites like Fikir Tepe itself and other sites in northwestern Anatolia, where we find this really typical uh, objects, this Fikir Tepe boxes. Uh, and in this case, also with a relatively typical decoration made by incised lines filled with a white substance. Um, from the courtyard or maybe the covered space in front of this oven and in front of this bin uh, from the these dirt surfaces that we found there we have uh, a, a very nice ceramic assemblage uh, uh, that, that sort of gives us a very good impression of what in the middle of the occupation period at Bargin around 6,300-200 6C the ceramics um, looked like Compared to the earlier phases, now the, the shape repertoire is more varied, it's more extensive. We have uh, small bowls, closed bowls. We have larger uh, bowls and ves vessels. We have more S-shaped profiles. Uh, in, in addition to sort of lug handles, we now also have these 
pots, uh, deep pots with uh, with uh, two uh, handles uh, <clears throat> on the on the shoulders. And in some cases, uh, on uh, these uh, on the larger vessels, we also have these incised uh, decorations, often these geometric patterns like triangles, etc. And this is this is a uh, generally uh, quartzite tempered uh, uh, wares, thin walled, very well fired, and 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 highly burnished ceramics. Um, Coming back to the overall plan, it's also interesting uh, to briefly look at the uh, the central row of uh, of houses. Here you see it from uh, from uh, above. Maybe I should indicate where these where these buildings are. So one uh, challenge that we faced here with excavating the architecture here from six E up to uh, uh, and including six C is that. Um, these buildings, the remains of these buildings were all sort of compressed in, uh, in about a meter of deposits, whereby the foundation ditches of newer buildings sort of were dug into the remains of these older buildings. Uh, and you can make out from this photograph how, uh, how I've indicated with white lines where the remains from this phase 6C uh, are located, but you can see quite a few other remains at about the same elevation or just below or just above from other phases. So uh, here you see building 15, but you can also already make out the post hole rows from the building 14 that, that uh, succeeds this in the next phase. Um, from this building 15, here in the, more in the background, uh, hardly recognizable because uh, of uh, the presence of other phases. Only wall ditches were left. We don't really know like what what um, uh, this building looked like apart from the outlines. But to the to the uh, east of it, we have two small narrow spaces, three and ten, and then four. Uh, that continues into the East Bulk that may have been, again, a, a larger uh, space, but we don't know. But if it's a larger space, then we have a pattern that we saw also in 6D1 of a sort of like alternation of smaller and bigger spaces. And on the photo here on the left, just sort of for scale, uh, you can see how this, this uh, um, structure 10 is really a, more like a, a corridor. It's a meter and a half wide uh, and about um, uh, four meters long, I think. So it's hard to imagine this as a, as a complete house with, with a, uh, a family living in it. It's more likely that this was a sort of like an, an additional space, an annex to a, another building. And the same goes for this uh, for this structure three. <laughs> now, even though these buildings uh, didn't burn down, um, when they were abandoned and when new floors, dirt floors, were put down um, um, inside these uh, structures, a lot of artifacts were left uh, behind on the floor. So you can see these um, uh, couple of concentrations of um, the types of artifacts that they've been using in these buildings and that they um, and that they uh, left behind. So, for example, here on the top right, a bone spoon, uh, hand stones, grinding stones, pounders, uh, hammer stones, etc. Uh, here, a, a, in the bottom left, a bone spatula and maybe an antler punch. Uh, if you look here in the middle top, also a bone spoon, uh, remains of a ceramic vessel smashed uh, on the ground. So from these two small rooms, we had a lot of evidence of uh, um, the types of artifacts they were using in, uh, in this uh, phase in 6D3 uh, and 6C. Um, and um, we can sort of get an idea of the, of the activities that were carried out there. So from these two rooms, here are some examples of the bone tool uh, implements that we found here. You can recognize bone spoons. We have from Bajanuk a very expensive, uh, extensive assemblage of, uh, of bone spoons. 
uh, many of the ones that we found here in, uh, in these small structures show heavy use. They're worn down, they're modified, etc. cetera. Um, there's spatulas, there are uh, smoothers, there's pins, there are what seem to be uh, fish hooks. Uh, and here's an example of a soft sandstone um, uh, uh, fragment with these grooves that must have been used to grind and shape bone into, into the shape of bone tools. Uh, similarly, uh, like we have a very extensive, uh, rich assemblage of bone tools from these rooms, we also have a very uh, varied assemblage of, of stone tools, ground stone tools. Uh, um, not only showing a sort of variety of, of uh, shapes and presumably functions, but also um, what appears like a very conscious selection of certain types of stones for certain activities um, and certain tools, which is something that we really did not see before in, in uh, the earlier phases. On this photo, you also see on the top left uh, a group of some uh, figurines. These were also found in one of these structures in structure 10 uh, in, the, in the entrance way. We think the entrance was, was here from the south. And in this corner, um, under a grinding platform that had been, had been uh, upturned and left in the corner upside down, and, and on top of which were heaped uh, this whole group of, of hand stones and, and uh, scapulas. Uh, when we, when we um, lifted up the stone, there was another sheep scapula or sheep or goat scapula underneath. Uh, and under that was a cache of these uh, unbaked clay figurines. Um, from this one, there were four. They, they were not in very good shape. They were partly uh, damaged from moisture and they were broken and it was not possible to completely reconstruct them. Um, but what is very clear is that they are uh, decorated that uh, most of the decorations occur sort of on uh, the thighs and the buttocks and the sides of these, uh, of these individuals. And that the upper torso and the arm and the, and the head uh, has given much less attention and much less detail. Uh, next, right next to it, there was another little pit with uh, uh, stones in it, but also with at least two more uh, figurines. And here, what is very clear, but what we also saw on the other uh, group of figurines is that they have these incised lines and that red and, and uh, black paint was uh, um, um, used of pi or pigment was used to decorate and maybe to indicate uh, the presence of clothing on these figurines. Um, it may be that in, in uh, these rooms themselves, uh, they were they were making pigments. We found a, a sort of concentration of uh, pigment. Maybe that had been stored in this in this vessel, and we also found a group of these of these very red stones that 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 actually uh, are relatively easy to grind down and that you can turn into this red pigment. Uh, so maybe that was one of the activities that took place in these in these uh, in these two rooms. One more thing I want to uh, uh, present, and that is that from this period, 63, 6C, uh, we also have a lot of burials. Uh, all the red stars on this, on this plan are burials. Uh, these, these burials actually date from a slightly longer period than just this architectural phase. Uh, uh, so it's not that all these individuals came from these houses, um, but uh, the plan only shows uh, one uh, building phase and the burials represent a slightly larger period. <clears throat> but what is clear uh, that uh, adults were generally buried in the courtyard here in front of the, in front of the houses. There are always single burials, they're always flexed, they're always on their sides. Uh, sometimes, uh, Individuals are also uh, placed on their back. And in a, uh, um, a number of cases of these adult burials, we find that they uh, were given spoons. Uh, you can, for example, make out one of these bone spoons here placed on the, 
uh, shins on the lower legs of this individual up here. Uh, and these tend to be spoons that are much less worn, show much less traces of use. Uh, so the adults and young adults were generally in the courtyard, but small infants we found generally in indoor locations. So in this structure four, there was a whole row of small baby burials. And here against the wall of structure 15, or maybe 14 that is not shown on the plan, but that uh, uh, came afterwards, also had a, a, a number of uh, small infant burials. Um, so what does this tell us about the development of this, uh, of this Neolithic settlement? To some extent, what, what we see and what is quite striking is that there is a lot of continuity. In 6E, the first settlers choose a location to build two buildings, to build two houses, and then for the next 400 years or so, that continues to be the location where they, where they built uh, a sequence of, um, of houses. There's a, a, a very strong adherence to this location, even though the settlement as a whole has a very open layout. There is a lot of open space. There's a lot of outdoor space where in theory, they could also have, have put their houses. So there seems to have been a very strong, um, a very stable practice or practices, cultural practices related to building traditions, but maybe also related to um, inheritance, to property uh, regulations, um, and and the and the structured use of settlement space. Uh, over time, I think we can see that the that the population of this community increases. We see that that previously empty spaces gradually get get filled up without leading to a to a uh, anything like uh, what we know from Chatalhuyuk or other sites where where the settlement space is completely built up here it remains quite open but overall there's a kind of infilling of the of the settlement space. Uh, the large number of burials also suggests that, uh, that the population increases. Now, I, I haven't addressed it and, I, and uh, I'm not going to talk about it, but after about 6,200, we see a few changes. In combination with a lot of continuity in the, in the building practices, in the material culture assemblages, but then for the first time in 6B, uh, buildings start appearing in, in, in new areas and this, this central row of houses that was continually, continuously inhabited for, uh, for 400 years then is left uh, uh, abandoned. Um, and uh, from 6A, as I said in the beginning, we have really very uh, little understanding of what the settlement looked like. Um, so that, that's uh, sort of a description of the phasing and of the settlement. And uh, with that, I'm going to pass it back to Rana to uh, add more of the of the context to this. Uh, thank you. So, uh, Doug at nine, uh, it's okay for me to uh, continue. I hope I'm, I'll try to be fast so as not not to take much uh, time. Yeah, I think you should people. definitely continue. Okay. Um, just a second, I have to find the um, presentation again. Um, here it is, sorry. Um, so I was just, uh, I'd like to, uh, first of all, um, try to, uh, bring things back together uh, and uh, also add some material culture. Foucault mostly talked about the, uh, the architecture, but um, we, uh, what kinds of things were uh, brought by these inhabitants when they first arrived? And what kind of things are coming in later into this? What kind of networks are they creating? How are they dealing with their environment? Some of these questions are critical. Uh, and uh, we can, as, as Foucault has already mentioned, we have this pioneer phase uh, of the earliest arrivals uh, of the arrivers. Uh, and after that, uh, we, he 
basically talked about 63, 60, and 61, where we begin to have a more established Neolithic phase. And I'd like to quickly, uh, without taking too much of your time, show you, um, show you some of these um, changes and what changes do we note through uh, the occupation, what kind of similarities, uh, continuities uh, do we see as well. Um, so uh, in terms of, let's first take a look at the things that seem not to change so much. Uh, in terms of the subsistence patterns, uh, we have uh, in uh, you know most of the cereals uh, and um, uh, are, are there. Some pulses uh, begin to increase later on, uh, but we seem to have uh, most of these uh, the package there from the beginning. Uh, the animal exploitation at the site is very highly uh, domesticated animals. They're bringing their animals with them, uh, and uh, there is some hunting. And we see this throughout the stages, from the very earliest through the later stages. Uh, again, we have a great number of uh, residue samples of which more than half are uh, dairying, uh, evidence for dairying. So we know that the, uh, probably cattle was used for dairying. And when we look at this through the phases, here's the earliest phase here, 6E, uh, we can see that the percentages are not changing that much through the phases. So from the very early stage onwards, there, 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 there seems to be some consistency there. However, uh, Foucault already showed the pottery, um, things with the pottery, uh, at least in terms of cooking, uh, seems to show uh, some changes, uh, despite the fact that they're eating the same things. Uh, for example, we, he was talking about the thick walled pottery, uh, and uh, this was very rare in the beginning, so that per cubic meter, we only had 14 sherds, and a great number of these um, cooking stones, or hot rock cooking stones that we have, uh, uh, so they're, uh, it's sort of unwieldy large pots that are using being used in conjunction with uh, these cooking stones. Uh, and um, later on, uh, by already 61, uh, the next phase, we're getting a large number of these uh, ceramic, um, uh, you know, sh uh, basically pots uh, that are directly being put on the fire with the calcite tamper that enables and allows uh, the, the heat to be conducted uh, right within the vessel walls without actually doing this indirect cooking methodologies. And we see a decrease through these stages uh, with 6E really standing out with firecrack stones. Uh, and when we look at the micro ceramics uh, up to 10 millimeters in size, we can see an increase uh, through time. And we believe this is very representative of the actual ceramic percentages so that they're increasing as we go through time from the heavy fractions. But what we do see, so this is one difference that we see between 6E and the rest, but 6E in itself, first of all, had a, uh, as Foka was mentioning, a lower population. Very few um, artifacts are actually present in the site in this very early level. We're finding some bone tools. In the very early phases, we have hardly any clay, uh, things like sling pellets and things. Those are gonna appear later. We have um, stone, these hammer stones, some bone tools. Uh, which are uh, locally sort of acquired. And in addition to this, we do have a couple of uh, dentalia, folk already showed this picture, uh, and very, very few uh, 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 numbers of obsidian that come from 6E, uh, almost none actually. Uh, so this is interesting because it so suggests that these people, they came from central Anatolia, settled there, uh, but it actually uh, questions the kind of contacts and the networks that they may have had with their surroundings. Uh, and uh, when we look at the, the obsidian data across the phases, here it's just like 1% or something. Uh, and it's only from the very bound going to 61, there's nothing from the earlier levels, which is interesting uh, because, uh, yeah, Dentalia is also showing contacts, but Obsidian is sort of your uh, high, it's sort of through the highways of connecting with others through maybe down the line exchange. Uh, how many neighbors did, did the margin have? Uh, how were these exchange networks set up? Later on, we clearly see that 
uh, more than a quarter of uh, the uh, the assemblage, uh, the chipstone assemblage is obsidian. So this is quite interesting. And we did further analyses to look at where this obsidian is actually coming from. And when we look at the different sources, we have Galatian, Nenezida, Melos, and Yoluda, uh, we were able to see that by 61, uh, we have a high concentration of it coming from Nenezida, which is just uh, where most of the ones from Chatalhuic are also coming at this time. But we do have at least one from Melos and a couple also coming from Yoruda. Uh, when we move over to uh, the next stages, we can see that the, these, in, these increases, uh, these increase in, in numbers from Melos and from Yoruda, in addition to Galatian sources. Uh, and they get even more diverse uh, as we move into the upper phases, where there's even ones where we don't have reference materials for uh, that, uh, that are they're sort of expanding in their networks with um, the kinds of connections that they're making, we can assume from this. Uh, so uh, I would say, uh, or we would say that this pioneer phase uh, is one where uh, things were um, qu not quite, uh, you know, the, the same way as it is in the established Neolithic phases, uh, but that uh, very shortly within, within a few generations of arriving, uh, things changed significantly uh, for some of these inhabitants. Uh, and uh, when we look at the later phases, uh, we can see uh, not only an increase in population, but an increase in the actual amounts of uh, tools and, and, and things and ceramics and, and bone tools. And uh, if you think about uh, sort of being uh, dependent on artifacts in, in, a, in an, uh, you know, a materiality sense, we really begin to see this happening by the time we reaching uh, the, the six uh, D1 and onwards. Uh, and here are some, some examples of some pots from 63 and 6C. You can see all the different bone tools that we found, uh, a plethora of them. We're finding also new types of materials. For the first time, uh, we're finding uh, stone, marble vessels. Uh, we're finding high numbers of sling pellets, spondylus shells, which are coming from probably the Aegean. So these beads uh, that are, uh, very uh, sort of uh, abundant there and, and, and rare here and never appeared in barge and in early levels. We're beginning to see them as we do see these female figurines, uh, which do not exist in the earliest levels. And as I said before, lots of bone tools. And here are some that are used. Uh, the ones in the burials were or not, they, they sort of wear down as you, you can see in the picture. And in addition, we're finding uh, these blue beads, which are uh, uh, actually man-made. They're artificial sort of uh, beads that are, are um, sort of replacement uh, turquoise, uh, sort of synthetic turquoise, if you will. Uh, they're trying to imitate um, uh, turquoise, which is not it, it, uh, available in Anatolia. The closest sources come from the Sinai. Uh, and instead, there is sort of uh, heating bone, um, an appetite uh, type of bone, in order to create these. And they are, again, um, uh, appearing around 6C, and they're showing us that they are connected with other societies uh, within uh, Anatolia and beyond, uh, ranging over actually a thousand uh, kilometers, because we're finding them uh, around 6,400, around the same time at Tel El Kerk in Syria, and all these other sites uh, where they are um, uh, in small or large numbers. But again, showing that the people by this phase uh, at Bargin are uh, within these networks. They're, they know the most popular, trendy uh, blue beads, and they're, and they're part of networks which we don't really see in, in 6E. Uh, so um, I'd like to just uh, uh, quickly uh, finish off with uh, some of these uh, examples and show you how uh, we can see that while we do have some of these stone axes and adzes and pottery um, and a few sling pellets um, uh, in the earlier levels it's, and, and bone spoons, they're really appearing uh, in full by 61. Uh, stone vessels, uh, blue beads, and the spondylus shells do not really appear until much later, the 6C levels that Foka was talking about. Uh, and so with that, let me uh, sort of sum up uh, and summarize uh, the kinds of things that we have um, uh, in this, um, this pioneer community. So from the very beginning onwards, we have a broad array of founder crops and the knowledge of farming. Uh, 
a selection of, of domesticated animals, prim primarily sheep, goat, and cattle, and no domesticated pig. Uh, we can see that lipid residues were there from the very beginning. Uh, and um, other than that, I tried to emphasize that these people in the very beginning had very little uh, in terms of material culture, uh, and their connections uh, were, were uh, still being built uh, within their community around them, which is what we might expect from pioneer communities that are going into these new regions. Um, they're experimenting with architectural techniques. Uh, these sort of making a post for each post hole is something that we don't have real many examples of. So they're trying to uh, work this out and later uh, decide to make ditches, which is much easier. So these things are, are, are um, you know, uh, some of the aspects we're finding. However, uh, within a short period of time, they are uh, making connections. We're beginning to see obsidian appear, uh, the practice of um, making, um, uh, you know, uh, blue beads and spondylus uh, shells uh, and female figurines are coming in. And they also have other connections as well, uh, like, for example, the red floor that Foka showed is something, uh, making floors uh, red is something that we know from Anatolian Neolithic sites. So they're part of these kind of networks as well, as well as the uh, the bull's horn that was beneath the footprint that might also be, even though it's a domesticated uh, 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 skull of a um, and horns of a bull, it might still be connected to some of the traditions that we know from Chatalhuyuk uh, with, with bull's horns. Uh, so in sum, just to conclude, the evidence from Barjanhuyuk overall shows us that we're dealing with a pioneering community that's adjusting uh, to a new landscape and adding gradual introduction of elements, much of which, which become established through continued contact and communication with networks of, um, of communities around Barjan. We also tried to underline that this ongoing neolithization process at Bargen involved innovations and transformation during the course of its occupation. When considering Bargen's neolithization, we must be aware of the, of the intricate combination of con uh, complex processes with uh, local uh, communities and the continued influx of regional stimuli from super regional networks that would have been active at the time. So thank you very much for listening to us and for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Rana and Fokka. That was great and um, gave us lots of information and lots of things to think about too. Um, so obviously I'm chairing the, the questions. Um, you can raise your virtual hands in, in a way we're all used to now or uh, put a question in, in, in the chat. And if for whatever reason I haven't quite noticed um, a question or a raised hand, do feel free to unmute and, and just butt in when there's a moment's pause at least, obviously. Um, so great. So uh, any questions? Uh, I'll just switch my chat on so I can actually see it. I think there's a couple of questions already as well as thanks. So Jill Goulder, hi Jill, uh, asks um, about spoons and spatulas uh, in the burials. Was there any trend of differentiation by gender? Um, she worked with you, obviously, and she said she says uh, in her trend, she remembers a female burial had a, a spatula, for example. So is there any gender trends in that regard? Uh, thanks, uh, Jill, for the question. You must have recognized some of the uh, images. Um, we're not we're not quite sure about the gender differentiation in relation to spoons and other and spatulas and other finds in the graves. Um, uh, which is partly due to the fact that, that not all the um, uh, sex identifications have been, have been done. Uh, overall, there are not so many grave gifts. Bones occur with some regularity. Um, we have one burial with a marble vessel. Sometimes there are some beads. Uh, sometimes there are animal bones that may have belonged to, uh, to uh, uh, may have been part of grave gifts. But overall, there's not a whole rich uh, assemblage of grave gifts to, to try to connect to um, burial practices or to gender um, uh, differentiation. Oh, thank you. Good to see you, Fokke. <laughs> Good to see you, Jill. Daniela has a raised hand. Daniela. Okay. 
Um, yes, I wanted also to ask about those spoons. Um, do you know which animal they were made of? Um, but I have also a couple of other smaller questions. Um, so maybe I'll ask them first and then you can choose the, the order you want to answer. Um, about those post holes, which are always um, a rather puzzling phenomenon. I mean, we think we understand what it's about and obviously there were posts in the holes, right? So this is just a wild thought that crossed my mind while I was looking at this. And especially because you mentioned the huge dimensions, the 80 centimeters deep and 20 centimeters um, diameter. So these are really huge trees that went in there. And because we have now this um, science fiction technique of obtaining uh, DNA from sediments, maybe if you try and keep sediments from those post holes, you may be able to actually find out via the DNA which wood they were made of. So this is just a wild thought and a comment, and I know it's easier said than done. Um, and then last, uh, about the dentalium shell, uh, beads, shell beads, um, I cannot say for sure. I don't know if anyone studied them at all, but just from a you know, quick look from your photos, um, they seem to me to be fossil dentalium, in which case they would be coming from the Hattai. But of course, without studying them, you know, more specifically, I cannot say for sure, but just because if I because I studied so many of those at Chateauvieux, uh, they look very similar. So that's all I had to say for today. Thank you. Should I answer at least about the uh, the the animal bones? Um, I mean the spoons. Uh, the uh, we a lot of the large ones are actually uh, coming from cattle. Uh, we we know that they're using. Uh, large, you know, the, the tibia of cattle for some of the, some of them are extremely, they're 30 centimeters long. Um, and uh, I think cattle is the preferred animal, um, you know, but the, and uh, they, there, there might be sheep and goat, but uh, I think it's mostly for the spoons, it's, it's cattle. And then the spoons get recycled in lots of different ways so that once they break, they're becoming awls and so they're using them um, uh, quite a bit there there a lot of them are very worn uh, in fact so uh, about the trees and the dna uh Fuga, did you want to say something i mean we uh we, we might I'm trying, know. To, I'm trying to remember we took soil samples we may we have did. we may have all the soil, soil samples are, are have been uh have been taken by uh, the ministry of presence so we don't have them to study anymore um mm -hmm. but if we ever get our hands on it we can consider uh potentially doing these analyses and uh, yeah. one, one, one thing we speculated about in relation to these uh, or this sort of change from heavy large posts at the very beginning and then going to smaller posts and, and foundation ditches is that it may be like after a while in the direct vicinity, there were just no large trees anymore to, to use, uh, that it was sort of an extravagant building and technique in the beginning when this was, when this was uh, easy. We have to say though, we don't we don't understand these structures very well. They look like very nice rectangular structures with a, a row of widely spaced central posts uh, going down the center. But we're not quite sure whether what we identified as rows is actually the location of the walls or whether this was supporting the roof sort of between the center and a wall further out. Um, we, we, we realized too late after we'd finished the excavations and after we filled the trenches again, that that we probably would have understood it better if we had ex made wider exposures around these around these buildings too. Um, but but um, uh, and we have we have sort of evidence for their presence and for the basics of their construction, but we don't understand them very well at all. Um, I don't know if. Uh, uh, Emma Baisal or, or Ellen, I think, is maybe also listening in, and uh, Ellen Belcher has uh, anything to say about the dentalium shells. Um, 
So we haven't but done an analysis of the dentalium. We have both um, cut dentalian and um, natural occurring longer ones that are uncut. Uh, we haven't done an analysis on, on where they might come from, but it's uh, we have quite many of them and um, they are within, uh, I, I didn't look at my data. I haven't looked at it for a little while, but um, it is within the top three types of beads that we have. Um, I believe in all in all levels, um, and it is the earliest. It continues throughout. Uh, there might be, they might be sourcing them from different places in different levels. It's a great idea to look at those if we are able um, to an analyze that. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you very much. Great. So Miraban has a, a question in the chat. Can you please tell us a little more on about the individuals buried in the midden? Are there any differences in burial practices or ancient DNA results from the other individual burial buried elsewhere? Yeah, one of them was on their back, but maybe Foka, you should go ahead and explain it. Yeah. Um, initially, we thought that they they showed sort of like a different way in which the bodies were positioned, and one of them seemed to have been sort of put down in a sort of sloppy fashion. But from um, 6E, we don't have adult burials from other parts of the settlement. So we have, we have a, a number of infant burials where it's often very difficult to, to see the exact position. Uh, my impression is, is that this is not unusual, but uh, that um, uh, as in later periods, a little bit away from the houses, they were burying uh, in so the open settlement space, whether that was uh, also used for garbage dumping uh, or not. But it, it doesn't seem to be concerning individuals that had something un, uh, unusual uh, about them. They didn't have any burial gifts though, did they? Uh, they didn't have burial gifts, no. no. Yeah. Thank Can you. I just personally follow that up by asking it, have you got um, isotope results at all that allows you to explore other dimensions of variability amongst the, the human burials at the site and the humans at the site? Yeah, this is a great question. We have isotope results now for our Byzantine uh, skeletons. Uh, we've done that, but not for the Neolithic yet. And so hopefully that's coming. Uh, so uh, yeah, and it's interesting. We, we can see uh, patterns in the Byzantine burials already. So hopefully the Neolithic is next to be uh, analyzed. That's great. Um, Denis Unsal has a question in the chat. Can you say anything about how this society was organized? Uh, did they um, have ownership property, uh, perhaps in relation to animals or of communal nature? Obviously that's a you know, interpretive leap for you to make, but uh, that's the question. Yeah. Thank you, Denis, for this question. Uh, well, it's a it's a difficult one. Um, we uh, do see um, these storage depots, at least, for example, at 61 with the mice uh, underneath them, uh, and they seem to be uh, of moderate size, um, whether it's a household or a group, it's difficult to actually um, to really say, uh, but we don't expect a very large um, population or large numbers. So uh, I can imagine that things were shared. Would you have any comments about that, Foka? Well, I mean, it's it's really difficult, of course, to talk about um, or to make sense of the nature of property relations, etc. But what is some somehow um, sort of what comes across from the from the settlement layout and the spatial organization is that there seems to be. Um, an emphasis on these communal spaces. Uh, and maybe that's also um, uh, implied by the fact that in this large open courtyard is where generally the adults were buried as if, as if it was sort of like a, a communal space as well as a communal uh, burial ground. Whereas on the other side, many of the indoor spaces are very small um they are not in any way sort of ostentatious so you could speculate that maybe 
um, in contrast to um, communities where the family or the household gets a very uh, emphasis in, in sort of identity constructions, here the community has a more prominent position in, in that, in sort of the social uh, organization. Great, excellent answer. Thank you, Fulke. Um Carlo Persiani from Rome asks um, how the blue beads um, get to their blue color. What technology is involved in that? Uh, well, for the blue beads, actually, we've done a lot of different analyses um, to try to understand how exact. I mean, we've tried to do experimental um, methods as well. And we've uh, been able to achieve uh, making um, with a sort of slurry uh, with a lot of um, manganese. Um, and now we think there might also be some arsenic involved as well. Uh, we've uh, been able to get the color, but um, uh, it, it involves heating it after it goes into the slurry, heating the bones. But what we uh, had with the, the problem we had in the same uh, experiment was also done by the Tel El Kerk team, the Japanese that were working on the same um, bone, uh, the same, I mean, not bones, but same beads that I uh, showed you already on the map as well. Uh, and uh, they become very fragile and, and, and sort of breakable. Uh, we then thought perhaps it was um, antler or something else. Uh, again, it has a very high calcium signature, so we know it's bone, but perhaps it's something harder. And we've done experiments with that, uh, but we haven't been able to achieve the same color. Uh, so it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a mystery, in fact, how, how it was done. Uh, but it's clearly um, it's clearly manufactured uh, turquoise because when you break it open, it's white on the inside, and it's um, the structure of the bone is visible. We've looked at it uh, under the scanning electron microscope. We've done um, you know all sorts of elemental analyses and uh, are now using XPS uh, analyses on it. So hopefully we'll have more uh, results uh, after more experimentation. Uh, it's already becoming a, a second uh, MA thesis now for, for someone working on this, so. A bit of a mystery is always fun as well, yes. isn't it? <laughs> I see uh, Ellen um, very helpfully posted a link to the uh, publication of the beads as well, so people can see that in the, in the chat. Um, the next question is from Sabina, uh, who asks about the possibility of seasonal occupation in, um, 6E um, in, in particular was the site seasonally occupied during the 6E phase. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, it's, it's definitely uh, impossible to rule out and, and we don't have confirmation from, from um, the animal bone or from other data for, for year round occupation. Um, my impression would be, but this is based mo mostly on these sort of fairly substantial buildings, that they were there permanently, that they were there year round and not just seasonally. Um, but it, it cannot completely be ruled out. Uh, I think uh, just the fact that um, we have such a large percentage of domesticated animals uh, just that these people, uh, you know, you would expect to have then more, um, I mean, I guess they could move with their animals uh, as well. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I would expect that they're living there full time. What we did find, um, in fact, uh, from the sediments geochemistry, which we didn't present here today, from beneath uh, the, the earliest floor, beneath the actual, before the houses were built, we had sort of uh, places where they had fire, uh, they had fireplaces and different sort of um, uh, concentrations uh, of uh, different elements that sort of suggested that the area was used. So in even before they came, perhaps they were sort of uh, having sort of uh, visits to this area uh, and then decided or uh, made their houses in that area after visiting it or something. That's kind of an impression we got from the sediment geochemistry. Um, but um, with regards to how, whether it was full-time, I would imagine so as well. That's, that would just be my hunch, but yeah. Great, thank you very much. Um, you, oh, um, even Maria, um, mentions that you can contact her in relation to sediment DNA for 
advice or input. So you might want to look that up on the chat. Um, Jill uh, then has a comment and question, I guess. So uh, she says, you'll recall that the later large house in my trench appeared to have had a outward collapse and rebuilding, apparently through insufficient central support of the gabled roof. That's very interesting about the growing shortage of large trees. Were they experimenting unsuccessfully with building techniques not involving big posts? Sounds an interesting question. Yeah, thank you, Jill. <laughs> um, uh, let me let me um, emphasize though that that apart from the observation that between the very earliest phase and the next phase we see a sort of decrease in the in the size of posts or, or post holes, we don't have other evidence for deforestation or a lack of good timber. Um, but um, that. And the building that uh, you described from 5B that that really had suffered a lot of damage and attempts to to um, put it up again and to yes. to deal with these walls that were going in different directions. Yes. Um, whether that's that's just sort of like one building that uh, had structural issues, or whether that was because of external factors like lack of good timber um it, it's hard to say but that that definitely was a very um complex and interesting building to excavate of course thank you yeah. great thanks jill um so i'll just if i may um follow up on that by asking okay if you do you have any um independent environmental evidence of a panological nature or through other forms of off-site sediment sampling of the nature of the environment and of the impact of the community when it arrived and, and then uh, following that at all? Yeah, we, we, we have some uh, geoarchaeological work that was done uh, in the direct vicinity of the site with, uh, with the coring and soil analysis. Uh, we didn't mention it, but that actually uh, showed pretty clearly that um, the site was um, uh, initially located just at the at the edge of uh, a very wet environment, either a marshland or maybe even a shallow open water um, to the to the south, and then slightly higher terrain going to the to the north, um, and. Uh, uh, over the Neolithic and then the rest of prehistory and the Bronze Age, there's sort of evidence for fluctuations in how wet and dry the environment in the direct vicinity is. Um, from the from the Yenishir Valley, already from the 1980s, there's also a pollen record, which um, is not all that informative uh, for uh, for the Neolithic. Uh, and calcolithic periods, but which which does suggest that at the time that they come there, um, um, it's a generally a forested area, and um, uh, that decreases a little bit. But I think by the time that uh, uh, is visible in the pollen record is already after the Neolithic. That's great. That's really interesting. Thanks, uh, Volker. Uh, Jürgen has a question. Yeah, thank you. Um, you mentioned that uh, in the oldest phases, there is a uh, um, schist temper in the pottery, and then later they turn to a calcite temper. And this, of course, reminds me very much of the Demergeuic stray finds. Do we have any idea uh, <coughs> what, what is the reason for changing? Oh, um, yes, I actually, I went uh, and saw the Demir Juhuyuk, uh, some of the sherds in Istanbul University, uh, and they are very similar to 6E sherds, so that's, uh, uh, the, 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 the 6E is that, that's sort of also very friable ship temp ship, ship temperature. Uh, uh, Lauren Sisson, the ceramicist, uh, thinks that this change, uh, which is gradual, actually, uh, mm -hmm. is um, for the conduction of heat uh, into the vessels because the, the calcite or the, the, the sand temper uh, enables um, the food to be cooked directly uh, when, the, when the vessel is on the fire. 
when schist, I think, is uh, makes the, the walls become much more th thicker and it uh, makes them heavy and it doesn't actually conduct the heat in the same way. So you need a lot more fuel, for example, to be able to cook your your food, um, and which is per perhaps why they're you they were using the hot rock technique and uh, putting it in. Uh, mm. You know, in that sense. So uh, thereafter, with the calcite temper, that's when we begin to see lots of soot already appearing at the bottom of these vessels, uh, indicating direct heating of them. So, uh, and then there's different uh, changes through, uh, that we see later on. I think there's also, um, you know, trends and changes that uh, the ceramic seems to go through. But uh, this one is is probably related to cooking technologies. Yeah. Right, thank the, you. Go ahead, focus. Sorry. Sorry. The, the later ceramics that I showed from 6D3 and 6C, um, by that time, it's mostly quartzite tempered. Mm -hmm. So, in between, uh, after this schist tempered wares, there is indeed uh, calcite used as the predominant tempering agent for a while, and then uh, it becomes mostly quartzite tempered. Mm. Uh, Nurjan uh, has a, a comment or question. Hi, Nurjan. Hi, Dr. Um, I was wondering um, a couple of things about the poetry, actually, uh, and it's a very interesting site, by the way, in general. But um, I was wondering, uh, these fire stones, um, you mentioned uh, that they, they were decreasing uh, in relation to the poetry increase mm -hmm. so uh, when was that in terms of you know date so um, uh, they have a lot of stones uh in 6e so that's starting 6600 and by 6500 yeah we find them because they always come from the bottom levels and everything but at that point uh we don't think they were actually using them for for cooking anymore it's just around uh, six five. Six five. Okay. Then, yeah. then they're using this calcite tempered. Uh, and we and as I said, there's soot. You can see the soot in inside and outside the vessels. They're just using, you know, direct heating. So uh do you think uh, when they were using the fire stones, uh in uh, what kind of containers? I mean, were they using them in Poultry again? They could have been, but there seems to be so few pots in the very beginning that there may have been other types of containers as well, because there really are uh, few. I mean, it's just a, a rarity in, in the earliest levels. Uh, you know, we can't say we have an A ceramic, but we can't say that ceramics were, you know, just like everywhere. I mean, there's very few. So something else yeah. may have been. I, I know this story from somewhere. <laughs> we were giving uh, small fine numbers to the pot shirts, you know, <laughs> at the beginning. <laughs> but, um, actually, we had we ha have a similar um, type of uh, issue in Chatalik, but we had uh, clay balls uh, rather than uh, you know fire stones, and so there was an idea that they were used in in this way actually, and then. Um, they were used in the baskets. So mm -hmm. um, it was um, Sonia. Uh, what was Sonia's surname, Doc? Atala. Do you remember? At uh, Atala. Atala, Atala. Yeah, Atala. Yeah. So probably so. I mean, you can also see again, uh, the, you know, her work was very interesting. So we were finding baskets maybe, but it's about the, you know, soil uh, preservation issue as well. And um, also, I was wondering um, the diachronic re relation between the thick walled pottery and the thin walled pottery there. Is it, I mean, coming, uh, you know, do they have diachronic relation? I mean, yes, they do. It's a gradual relationship. Nothing is sudden, but it's, it's initially is quite thick and very heavy. Uh -huh. uh, and it may have been also. Uh, sufficient for for heating but perhaps just unwieldy and 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 using lots of fuel and things like this but uh in time it becomes thinner uh and then uh we really begin to see it being used as a cooking device directly 
Yeah, it's very, very similar situation in Chatal. At the beginning, they were using local uh, clay and they had to add uh, some organic tempers in it. And it was thick walled. Mm -hmm. And we don't have many uh, fire traces underneath of those ones. And they're open bowl like stuff. Mm -hmm. And then the whole mouth thin stuff starts. And maybe the, uh, and you were saying that the calcite uh, temper and schist temper, are they really temper or are they in the, in the like inclusion? They really are temper. Correct me if I'm wrong, Foka, but they're really added, uh, yeah, into it. Uh huh. Yeah. That's very interesting because in our case, uh, the the uh, the thin uh, walled uh, cooking pots, the source was coming uh, from a distance, actually. No, the schist has to be actually ground uh, to be able to be added. Yeah, ours were inclusions, not temper, the mineral temper. Uh, stuff. This is uh, completely the work of uh, Lau and Stitson, of course, but one thing that he observes that uh, innovation in the pottery production by about uh, 6,500 is uh, that they start using a, a pedal and anvil technique to, to make the walls thinner. Uh -huh. I don't know if that's something that also um, occurs at Chatal at the same time, but in, in um, the way Lauren sees the ceramic development is that it, it's very connected in technologies and, and concepts uh, to what happens at Chatahuyuk. Um, but at the same time, it is related. I mean, the, the technology also related to the raw material because they wouldn't be able to do much about, uh, much about the shape when they were using the local uh, more like whitish uh, clay, uh, thin clay uh, stuff. The, uh, the 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 clay was not uh, easy to cook uh, without breakage and stuff. So they had to add chaff in it. So then they were discovering uh, that sort of raw material, which has a lot of um, um, volcanic uh, type of uh, material in it as in inclusion, you know, naturally uh, was in it. And they were coming from abroad almost, you know? <laughs> uh, I mean, like, uh, I don't remember now, but it's like uh, in a 80 kilometers, mm. you know, 40, 80 kilometers away. And they were not uh, like mixed with the river sediments. So they were coming from somewhere specific. So they are shifting in the raw material to be able to shape the pots uh, more, you know, bigger, deeper and thin, uh, thinner walls. Yeah, it's, it was very interesting, but the, the you know, the changing uh, modes uh, came to me quite similar in this way and this fire stones as well. Great, thanks very much, Nujan. That was very useful and interesting, I think. Um, Moritz comments that he's very keen to get together with you, Ran and Fokker, to talk architecture. I guess that isn't a complete surprise. Um, <laughs> and then um, Ellen also uh, just comments to let people know that there were quite a range of different shades or types of blue, five, she reckons, mm -hmm. uh, according to her Munsell chart record. So, you know, that's, that's interesting too, I guess, about the beads. Um, I can't see anyone else got a question, so I'll, I'll ask just one more and then we can see if there are any final questions. Um, I was quite interested in terms of the overall patterns in regard to storage. I think you did mention, Fokker in particular, but it was you that you, know, you make it, mentioned a couple of instances where you seem to have evidence that might relate to storage. But thinking about the more general patterns, I mean, did there seem to be any um, widely distributed types of storage? Um, installation or fixtures or evidence in in the buildings or outside the buildings more and did that change through level and indeed does it seem very much evidence for storage actually that 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 is um uh something we don't really have very good information on we have, we have some uh examples where we can say like here something was stored or this was 
possibly used for storage. Uh, I, I showed a picture of this group of lentils that seem to have been stored in a bag or something in one of these small rooms. Um, I, I described this sort of square sunken bin um, that, that may have been used for storage of something, but where we don't have evidence for it. So um, there's, not, there's no standard type, no clear evidence for, for storage. So whether this was inside the houses or outside or in shared facilities or in um, household facilities, we don't know. So, if at all, presumably in, in maybe baskets and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. And obviously it's difficult to know the, the scale then, yeah. Sorry, Rana, you were saying. I was just going to say, like uh, in the small rooms, the, the, the two smaller rooms in 61, uh, we also found a sort of a collections, collections of other things. There were a uh, little pile of, um, you know, cow ribs, for example. I mean, you can consider it sort of storage as well in some ways for later use. And there were, um, was it mussels, uh, Foka? Uh, that they had a little bag of mussels uh, that they sort of had, you know, put there and then the lentils in another room. So uh, there may have been some other sort of containers, as you were saying, Doug, for these things. And um, the the raised platform does suggest that uh, it could have been more storage. But uh, despite the fire, we didn't find as much as you would expect in a depot. <laughs> That's quite, yeah, so it's, that's a very interesting dimension, isn't it? You know, um, especially in terms of, you, you know, if you think of the community potentially being sedentary right from the beginning or whatever. So um, very interesting, thank you. Uh, I don't see any more raised hands or any more questions. Um, I think we had a, a pretty good discussion and thanks for dealing with all the questions so well. And of course, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. It was, it was really interesting. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you. you.